Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. Helium is the second most abundant element in the universe, uh, but you may have seen news stories in recent years about its scarcity. I know I was recently at like a party store and they had the sign on the door that said, sorry, no helium. Yeah, <laughs> I um, uh, when, when my brother got married, which at this point was some years ago, uh, I was tasked with uh, getting the helium container and some balloons for some decorating that we were DIYing. Uh, and then I still had the leftover helium in the container and one of the shortages happened and I was like, what am I supposed to do with this? Do can I, need, can I need I, to bring this to the helium <laughs> bank? Can I donate it somewhere? What's happening? Yeah. Uh, and helium, uh, just for very quick overview, is an inert gas. It is not prone to combining with other elements. It has no color and no odor. And it is very important here on Earth. Uh, we'll get into why later. But it is also not bound by planetary gravity. So it doesn't tend to stick around on Earth on its own. And the story of helium and our understanding of it has some interesting aspects to it. Aside from the fact that it sits at the earliest intersection of astronomy and chemistry, it also features two scientists who were working on similar ideas concurrently with a sort of surprising outcome in that in that particular piece of the story. Uh, so we are going to talk about those two men and how humans started to figure out what helium even was. And then we're going to follow Helium's story right up to the present day and some of those issues with its availability and what the problem is. Pierre Jules Caesar Jensen was born on February 22nd, 1824, at home at 14 Rue Leveque in Paris. His father, Antoine Caesar Jensen, was a musician, he played the clarinet, and his mother was Pauline Marie Lemoyne. Both sides of the family were really stable and comfortable. You'll often see his name listed as Pierre Jensen, although he's signed his name often as as Jules or simply J, and so that's we're going to go with that. Jules was the only son of Antoine and Marie, and he was very much beloved. Then when he was eight, he had an accident. Some sources attribute this accident to the carelessness of the nurse who was watching over him. It left him... Uh, pretty universally described in the language of the time as lame, although the specifics of this injury and his level of mobility, that's not really detailed anywhere. No, you will always see the phrase that he had an accident as a child, which left him lame, but it doesn't say if he had difficulty walking. There are some pictures where it looks like one of his arms maybe is not fully functional, but I can't, it's hard to tell if that's just like early photography, awkward sitting versus an actual problem with his his physical capability. But uh, so we don't know. And it's a little bit of a weird thing that always comes up, but we don't have a whole lot of specifics around yeah, it. It's, it's clear that he had a disability. It's not clear exactly what. Correct. But due to that accident and its result, though, Jules was not sent to boarding school, which would have been the normal course for a child of his economic situation at the time. He was educated at home instead, and he actually got a very well-rounded curriculum that included both arts and sciences. When he was a teenager, though, everything changed. Right around the time he would have been 15 or 16, his parents fell from their comfortable financial situation into poverty. It's not clear exactly what happened. Speculation tends to focus on some kind of bad investment that wiped out their fortune, but whatever happened to the family money, they moved to a more modest home. Jules was put into a position where he was no longer the pampered child of this well-off couple. He had to go out and earn some money. And so in October of 1840, Jean Sen began working in a bank. That was a job that he actually held for the next seven years. Either the family's sudden loss or his consequent career in banking or the combination of those two things seemed to make a very strong impression on him because he was frugal for his entire life and he kept very meticulous accounts of his finances at all times from 1840 on. Jensen worked for two other employers after leaving that first bank, first for a Monsieur Boulet, and he worked with him from 1847 to 1848, and then for a Monsieur Lapel, and he worked there for several years, starting in 1848. Throughout this work as a financial clerk, Jules continued his studies, but he had to wedge this into some pretty minimal free time. He took classes at the Paris Conservatory on Sundays, and then throughout the week, he learned higher math on his own. He read books by mathematicians like Etienne Bezu and Sylvestre-Francois Lacroix. 
He also learned Greek and Latin by studying on his own, and in January of 1849, he earned his Baccalaureate of Letters. His Baccalaureate of Mathematical Sciences followed in November of 1850. In 1851, having worked so incredibly hard to educate himself for a full decade, Jensen was enrolled at the Sorbonne, and he was 27 at this point and entered his graduate phase of study. And at this point, when someone reaches that level of education and that point in their life, it would have been customary for him to travel throughout Europe for extended periods of time, both for education and life experience. But Jules could not afford the trips that his contemporaries were making. He had to continue to work various jobs as a substitute teacher and as a private tutor, and then make small trips as time and finances allowed. In the mid-1850s, he traveled with two of the young men he was tutoring. These were Ernst and Alfred Gandidier, and they went to South America. Uh, Jensen's goal was that he could take advantage of the travel opportunity to delve into what he had decided would be his primary career focus, which was research. He wanted to resolve, quote, certain questions about the physics of the globe on this trip by making magnetic observations at various points on their travels. This was the first step in a research career that would take him all over the planet. And before we continue with Jensen's story, we have to talk about another man, because their lives and their science intersect. And that man is Norman Lockyer. Lockyer was born Joseph Norman Lockyer on May 17th of 1836 in Warwickshire, England. His father, Joseph Hooley Lockyer, was a science educator, and that probably uh, sparked Norman's interest in this subject. Lockyer was educated in private schools, and once he got out into the world after graduation, he started working in the civil service at the war office. Yeah, we don't have as many details about Lockyer's early life. It seems like he had a pretty normal uh, uh, youth. But throughout his years of work in the civil service, he became really, really interested in astronomy. And he acquired a telescope in 1861 that was made by the famed lens expert Thomas Cook. And a few years later, he also had a spectroscope. Throughout the 1860s, Lockyer spent a great deal of his free time studying the sun with his spectroscope, first looking for sunspots and then considering what exactly the sun was composed of. That was a topic that was very much at the forefront of science theory at the time. And that leads us back to Jules Janssen. Before we get into the next part of Helium's history, though, we're going to take a quick sponsor break. On August 18, 1868, Jules Janssen made history as the first human to observe helium. But of course, at the time, he did not know it was helium. He just knew that he had observed something that had not been seen before. He was in Guntur, India, to observe a total eclipse. And before we talk about how he was able to make that observation of the sun's corona, we have to talk about spectroscopy. The prismatic observations that were made possible by the spectroscope allowed scientists to analyze light, including measuring the wavelengths in light. When light from an element passes through a spectroscope, the various spectra are dispersed. They can be observed and documented to develop a set of data that can then be applied to other observations. Scientists started using this information when observing the heavens to compare the light that was admitted from other bodies to that that was associated with elements on Earth to try to discern what elements things and elsewhere in the universe might be composed of. This was one of my favorite parts of astronomy class. <laughs> yeah, uh, I had the good fortune a few years back to go visit the uh, NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center and speak with Stephanie Milam, who is one of their um, space chemistry experts. She has a, a much better and more official title than that. But like listening to her talk about all of this was completely enthralling to me. And I love this idea when we look at something and people go, oh, yes, that planet is made of glass. And I'm like, how do you know? <laughs> But here is how. Uh, So the science that develops spectrometry goes back to Isaac Newton, actually, who observed sunlight through a prism and saw that different colors of the spectrum refracted differently. He was actually trying to solve a problem of these halo-like rims of different colored light that appeared around objects in the focus of telescopes. Red light, for example, has a longer wavelength than blue, and the other colors on the spectrum all have their own wavelengths. And any given instance of light is made up of combinations of these various colors on the spectrum. Bavarian scientist and lens expert Joseph Fraunhofer did a lot of work in examining light, specifically sunlight, and the spectrum of colors that the sunlight contained. 
As he started cataloging the light and its various wavelengths, he noticed dark lines that appeared in some parts of the spectrum when he looked at light from the sun and other stars. These dark lines held the key to unlocking the chemistry of space, but Fraunhofer didn't know that yet, and he didn't live long enough to realize what he was onto. Yeah, he knew he was onto something, and he did a a lot of really groundbreaking work, but he didn't quite get to that whole thing of like, oh, these are elements. The two men credited with moving spectrometry forward are Robert Bunsen, yes, the same one that the burner is named for, and Gustav Kirchhoff. And when Bunsen's gas-fueled burner was used to heat elements, the spectroscope then revealed lines when that was those elements were viewed that were similar to Fraunhofer's, and they corresponded to Fraunhofer's on the visible light spectrum. So they had identified the concept of signatures of elements, and they quickly started to experiment with a number of different elements to identify their signatures. Soon they realized that this work was opening up the analysis of objects in space in a whole new way. Kirchhoff is credited with identifying 16 different elements within the sun, and that was just the beginning. As this new technology evolved, Jules Jensen was fascinated by it, and he was very eager to use it. And he, like other scientists of the day, spent a lot of time focusing on the sun. And he was especially eager to examine the prominences, those are those sort of flames that appear at the sun's surface, like part of the corona, you'll notice those those little um, sort of larger stabs out into the, the corona. So when the 1868 eclipse came around, Jensen was certain to be at what he believed would be an ideal vantage point in a location that had started as a French colony in India's Andhra Pradesh state in the 1700s. He wrote to his wife Henriette of how pleased he was with his setup there, saying, quote, We have the whole of an immense room for our instruments. These families are proud and happy to receive us. He also realized he could rig this setup with a prism and a slit so that he could observe the sun in broad daylight without the need for an eclipse. From his vantage point in India, Jansen was able to identify a bright yellow line through his spectrometer. It did not match up with any of the data collected on any known elements that other scientists had identified. It was kind of close to sodium, but not an exact match, so it appeared to be the discovery of a new element. On October 24th, 1868, Jensen's letters about his observations to the Academy of Science arrived in Paris, and they were read before the members two days later. Meanwhile, Lockyer was doing his own work regarding solar prominences in the fall of 1868. He did not travel for his observations, though. He stayed right at home at 24 Fairfax Road in Hampstead, but he did acquire his own spectroscope for the purposes of this research. And while he looked at the sun on October 20th of that year, he too figured out a way to look for such observations without waiting around for an eclipse. And he too identified the lines that he thought represented a newly observed element. Lockyer wrote to the Royal Academy in London and the Academy of Science in Paris, and his work was read the same day as Janssen's. Lockyer's and Janssen's work, which developed coincidentally along the same timeline, but miles and miles apart, and with no knowledge of one another, each offered confirmation of the others. And at the time, while they both saw that mystery line that suggested an unknown element in the mix, what was really getting attention was their ingenuity in figuring out how to observe the sun at any time, not needing an eclipse. We've covered concurrent work and scientific breakthroughs on the show before where this kind of scenario sets off a chain of events that turns ugly, basically with multiple people trying to take credit for the same thing and getting at each other's throats about it. So you might expect that Janssen and Lockyer would become bitter rivals at this point with each one angrily claiming that the other had stolen their thunder. We are happy to report the exact opposite happened in this case. Yeah, as the Academy of Sciences tried to figure out who should get credit and how to, like, handle this fairly, uh, one of its members, French astronomer Hervé Fay, offered up the possibility that they could give credit to both men equally, suggesting, quote, instead of trying to proportion the merit of the discovery and consequently diminishing it, would it be better to attribute impartially the whole honor to both of these men of science who, separated by some thousands of miles, have each been fortunate enough to reach the intangible and invisible by a method which is probably the most astonishing that the genius of observation has ever conceived? Sharing. What a concept. (laughs) 
And both Jules Johnson and Norman Lockyer thought this was just fine. But though there was no animosity or struggle between the two of them, the same really couldn't be said for the scientific community regarding their mystery element. For one, nobody knew exactly what this new element was that the two men had each independently observed. That left the discovery open to some skepticism and criticism. It was a really tough ask to get people on board with the idea that an element was found in space that didn't also exist on Earth. Even though two men had seen the same thing independently, some of them were dismissing the idea of a new element on the sun as imaginary. Yeah, of course, uh, we just didn't know about helium on Earth yet. (laughs) Uh, And to try to identify this mystery element, because they had, again, agreed that they would share credit for having discovered a way to look at the sun without an eclipse, they were still both trying to figure out, and uh, Lockyer in particular was really trying to figure out what this thing was they had seen. So to try to identify it, he started working with a chemist named Edward Franklin, who was the chairman of the Royal College of Chemistry. And the hope was that the wavelength that had been observed by Lockyer and Jensen could be replicated in a lab environment, and this marker could be replicated. The theory was that that yellow line that Lockyer had seen was perhaps hydrogen that was exhibiting unique characteristics due to temperature and pressure, but no dice. No amount of futzing around with hydrogen gave the same results. Lockyer had already given this element a new name after Helios, the Greek god of the sun. But Franklin, who wasn't convinced that Lockyer actually had a new element, backed away from that situation. He did not want any credit for his work on the project because he didn't want his name associated with a false scientific claim, even one that was being made in earnest. Yeah, uh, a lot of elements were coming up as possibilities at this point, and many of them were not uh, were not actually new elements. They were just mislabeled or or some sort of lab problem. Uh, of course, we know all about helium today, and we're going to talk about how it came to be identified with certainty after we first pause for a word from a sponsor. <laughs> It took almost three decades from the time that (laughs) that Jensen and Lockyer were making their observations for helium to be isolated and identified on Earth. William Francis Hillebrand noticed in 1889 while observing a uranium oxide known as uraninite that a unique gas was present, and he isolated that gas and determined that it contained nitrogen and something else that could not be identified. And this same result was replicated several times with samples from multiple locations. In 1895, Scottish chemist Sir William Ramsey thought that the mystery element in Hillebrand's experiments might be argon. But when he worked with the samples, he realized that what was present was that same signature that Lockyer had previously noted and claimed was a new element. Scientist William Crookes confirmed the match to Lockyer's helium as well, and at last, the work of, ya- of Lockyer and Jensen was recognized as a legitimate discovery and not a misidentification of a known element. This put the credit for the discovery of terrestrial helium up for debate. This didn't go quite the same way as the previous who gets credit discussion. Uh, Hillebrand wrote to Ramsey and he told him that he had thought that there could have been a new element in the mix, but he had, quote, not the slightest thought of claiming or hinting at a prior discovery. He wrote in his letter that he really just wanted Ramsey to know that he was not a careless fool. He knew there was something there, but that there had simply been enough scientific development in the years between his work and Ramsey's work that it allowed helium to finally be identified. Swedish scientist Per Theodor Klev made a claim to the title of co-discoverer, saying that he and colleague Nils Langlet had been doing similar work to Ramsey's. Their scenario played out very differently from that of Jensen and Lockyer. They did not want to share credit at all. Today, they are both recognized for their work in identifying helium on Earth. And then in the early 1900s in the U.S., Hamilton P. Cady and David F. McFarland, uh, working in Kansas, developed a method to quickly identify the percentage of helium in a sample of natural gas, as well as a way to extract it from other gases. As for Lockyer and Jensen, they became not only acquaintances after their independent discoveries united the two of them, but they also became good friends. They were friends until Jules Jensen's death at the age of 83 in 1907. They had been friends at that point for 39 years. Yeah, they really became quite close, which I think is the sweetest part of this story. (laughs) Um, As we said, often it becomes a very... um 
you know, headbutting battle over who gets credit for what. And instead, they were like, what? You did this too? You're so smart and cool. You're so smart and cool. Let's be BFFs. <laughs> I'm sure that's exactly how it played out. Uh, but in the years between the 1868 discovery and his death, Jensen went on to invent a high-speed camera, which he called a photographic revolver. He had observed many celestial phenomena, and he served as the first director of the Mudon Observatory. In 1903, he published a book of 6,000 photographs of the sun. His work in solar photography far surpassed the work of all others, and it was considered the gold standard for half a century. In 1920, a memorial to Jensen was erected in southern Paris. Lockyer's work beyond the identification of helium in solar prominences included the founding of the periodical Nature in 1869. He served as Nature's editor for 50 years. As the 19th century came to a close, Lockyer studied the connections between astronomy and the architecture of ancient civilizations, examining the ways that the monuments of the Greeks and ancient Egyptians aligned with astronomical events. He placed the date of Stonehenge's construction at 1848 BCE, which was partially verified by carbon dating in the mid-20th century. Of course, there are multiple dates associated with different sections of Stonehenge as construction happened over multiple phases over many years. Yeah, so you'll see, like, the date of Stonehenge, if you just look that up on the internet, as many different dates. But uh, he was correct in the, the section that he identified. And Lockyer's career was one of distinction. He became the secretary of the Duke of Devonshire's Royal Commission on Scientific Instruction and the Advancement of Science in 1870. That's one title. And he went on to join the Science and Art Department of South Kensington in 1875 at the request of Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli. Lockyer died on August 16, 1920. The observatory that he started remains in Devon, and now it's a public science education center called the Norman Lockyer Observatory. And as we mentioned at the top of this episode, in recent years, helium has made a lot of headlines because of shortages. Even though it's abundant in the cosmos, it is not so abundant on Earth, which is a problem. We know that helium is vital to party balloons and that hilarity ensues when someone inhales it and then speaks with the resultant squeaky voice, but helium is a really vital part of science, industry, and medical practice. Helium is used in MRI machines and missiles as a coolant for superconducting magnets. Particle accelerators need it. Satellite instruments are cooled by it. And deep sea divers use it in their air mix for highly pressurized conditions so they don't get the bends. It's even part of the barcode scanning laser systems in many grocery stores and retail checkout lanes. Because helium doesn't burn, it's also ideal for use in rocket engines. And it is not something we can manufacture. Helium results when uranium decays in what are known as gas traps, which takes thousands and thousands of years, and we are using it far faster than we find it. Over the last decade, the price of helium has increased 250% due to rising demand and dropping reserves. In the 1920s in the United States, the Federal Helium Reserve was established in Amarillo, Texas. Helium is part of the city's identity now, and the the U.S. stock of helium is very carefully tracked, but the once abundant reserve is not that robust any longer. In 1996, Congress passed legislation requiring the U.S. Bureau of Land Management to sell off all helium stores by 2013. That didn't play out quite that way, though, and the remaining helium stores are supposed to be sold off via auctions over the next several years, with a deadline of September 30th, 2021, to try to get the United States out of the helium trade. That is because maintaining helium is really expensive, and the cost of continuing to do it was deemed to be greater than any benefit that came from it. This is really creating a potential crisis for science labs in particular. Yeah, when you read articles about it, it's always when they talk to someone who needs helium in a lab scenario where they're like, I I don't know, I feel like we're playing with fire because we're doing all these experiments that require it, and if it suddenly goes away, like, all of our research just stops, which is terrifying when you're in, like, a multi-year project. We humans blaze through about 6.2 billion cubic feet of helium each year, and there are actually only 14 suppliers of helium on the entire planet. The U.S. has seven of them, and the rest are in Australia, Poland, Russia, Algeria, and Qatar. And that also means that shifts in the global economy and any trade relations can deeply impact the helium industry. And in 2016, more than one trillion liters of helium were discovered in Tanzania under a volcanic valley. 
That find was significant because it marked the first time we have found helium when we were actually looking for it. All of the previous finds were sort of happy accidents when people were trying to find natural gas. But even when helium is found by accident, it's not always possible to collect and store it because that process is expensive. That Amarillo facility keeps helium stored in a dolomite rock layer, and that is just not something that can be replicated very easily. Yeah, it's tricky. We need it really bad, but no one really has the money to maintain a facility for it. Uh, I mean, even the one that we have that has been going on for a long time, we're trying to shut down. And make no mistake, helium is in the air we breathe in very, very small amounts. But it is also... uh, really difficult, even though we mentioned those two men that figured out how to isolate it from uh, other gases, it's really costly, making it almost impossible to isolate its gaseous state from other elements in the atmosphere around it. And it is so light that it is always rising, rising away from the Earth and right into space. Uh, There is work being done on conservation, including just making people aware of what's happening. Tracy mentioned that she had this leftover helium and was suddenly like, should I donate this? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I don't know that individual donations of tiny tanks would be that much of a help, but we are trying to figure out how to make helium something that we're not so wasteful with. Uh, There is work underway to make it possible, for example, for science labs to actually recycle the helium that they use. So helium's history, in terms of our knowledge of it, is a pretty brief and intense arc. Over the course of 150 years, we've gone from not knowing that helium was a thing to finding all kinds of uses for it, to facing a shortage crisis. Uh, 2019's helium shortage is the third to happen in 14 years. Yeah, and there have been many others uh, over the course of that 150-year history. And what always happens is something like that find in Tanzania. I'm not sure how much that has been able to be um, actually, like, harnessed and used, like, stored and used, which might be why we are facing this, this shortage now. Uh, And hopefully (laughs) there will be other ways to figure out how to manage helium because we do seem to need it. The space program is going to be in big trouble if we really run out. It's it's one of those fascinating things that I didn't really think about a lot until these shortages started cropping up in the news several years ago. Uh, I, I don't know that all that it's really all that common knowledge that we're using helium in all of these very important things. Uh, and maybe not always being smart about how we manage our usage of it. Uh, But that is helium. I have two pieces of listener mail. They're both fairly brief. One is a lovely postcard uh, from our listener, Jim. And it is a postcard from one of my favorite places, Disney World. He writes, Dear Holly and Tracy, greetings from Disney World. As promised, I am... uh, Taking a moment out of my honeymoon to say hi. Having an amazing time. Thought of the Haunted Mansion episode the entire time I was in line with my wife. Keep up the good work. Regards. Uh, One, thank you for taking time to write us a postcard while you're on your honeymoon. Two, congratulations on your marriage. I hope it is long and happy. And three, hooray, Disney World. I'll go back very soon. Thank you, thank you, thank you for taking time to write us that postcard. My second uh, listener mail is an email that came from our listener, Diana, and it is about our recent episode on Frida Belenfante. She wrote, Hello, as a cellist, teacher, and conductor, I wanted to say how much I appreciated your episode on Frida Belenfante. I had not heard of her before. What a remarkable woman. Thank you for your work. I have attached a photo of my tuxedo cat for you. Her name is Kitty. Uh, Kitty is cute as pie. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Also, thank you for being uh, an educator. I'm always very grateful for the educators in our audience because they are doing important work. Uh, so if you would like to write to us, you can do so at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. That is a new email address. Please note it. You can also find us on social media as Missed in History pretty much everywhere. And mistinhistory.com is the website address you can come and visit us at. If you would like to subscribe to the podcast, you can also do that. It sounds like a very good idea. You can do that on the iHeartRadio app at Apple Podcasts or wherever it is you listen. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 